Hello, uh, welcome everybody. Hello. We are here today with Michelle Johnson, mm -hmm. who is uh, another one of our Thrive Programme coaches who specialises in working with people, helping people with emetophobia, mm -hmm. being an ex-emetophobe herself, and particularly Michelle specialises in helping uh, young children with emetophobia and helping the parents with young children with emetophobia. So we haven't stopped doing podcasts with Joe. Uh, those podcasts are continuing and we're going to do some other podcasts with other coaches as well. But for the next few weeks, you're going to see a lot of the lovely Michelle. And I asked Michelle, what do we want to start with? And she, she came back to me very, very quickly with one of her friends said to her, and I'm reading this off here, yeah. please just tell me I'm not crazy. Yes. Right. So can you tell me about that, Michelle, please? What, what's that about? Yeah, well, it was um, actually when I was talking about what I do and my job, which is it's not something I talk about. You don't do that with your friends, really. You're, you're having a good time, whatever else. I haven't particularly mentioned it. And um, I was chatting away about it and she went, really, is that what you do? And I was like, yeah, and she's like, I've got that. I've had that for ages. I was like, right, OK. So we had a chat about it. And she just said, I just, I feel so much better. I just wanted someone to tell me I wasn't crazy. And she'd never met right. anybody else with it. And she'd never, yeah, nobody else in her life had it. She'd never talked to anybody else about it particularly. Um, so, yeah, she just wanted, she was just really relieved that it was a thing. <laughs> and, and, and and so so what was it about suffering hmm. from it that, that made her feel like it was crazy? Because, you know, some people have, have phobias and they don't feel like they're crazy. If they've yeah. got fear of the dark, they don't feel crazy. So yeah. why? why? Because I've heard that many times. When you said it to me, I'd heard it many times before. People yes. must think I'm mad. I think I'm mad. Yes. What was it that led to feeling crazy? It's quite a strong word. Um, well, I can't answer that for her because I'm not obviously her, but I can answer it for myself because when she Go said on. it, I thought it threw me right back to when I had it and thought that's exactly how I used to feel. Exactly okay. the same. And it's because I'd never, same as her, I didn't know anybody else that felt this way. And actually, I knew really intellectually that being sick wasn't a terrifying thing, but I was absolutely petrified of it. So it, it didn't make sense in my head the why I was so scared. I couldn't understand it. And I was doing all these behaviors and avoiding things and spending a lot of time in your own head. Because obviously you don't talk about it. It's, it's called secret phobia for a reason. But, okay, hold, 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 hold right there. Yeah. Why don't you? Why didn't you talk about it? At what, the what time, you? It's, a, it's a complete fear of being judged because, as we both know, right, I'm judging myself too. I'm now in fear other people are judging me. If I've got this phobia and I don't understand it, and I know intellectually that I shouldn't be doing all these things and I didn't want to be doing all these things, but I still was, if I told other people that I was doing that, but I already thought I was crazy myself. Well, they were going to think I was crazy. So it's a, it's right, okay. a, a fear of social judgment. It's a, a social okay. anxiety. But, but, but not, not necessarily for the phobia itself, but because of your safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours. Yes, yes. Right, okay. Absolutely, yeah. Because okay. you spend if a lot If they weren't time. there, yeah. if they didn't exist and you yes. just had the phobia, yes. do you think you'd have felt better about talking about it? Had you told your parents and your friends? Not for a long time, no. No, not for a long time. Uh, yes, I think I would have felt better about it um, because it's you spend a lot of time, or I certainly did, spend a lot of time in your own head firefighting, being so on edge with everything and preempting things and looking at situations that were coming up or things and you're going, oh, how can I get out of that? Thinking of weird and wonderful excuses as to how I can avoid that thing without actually saying I can't come because I'm scared of being sick because what the event was actually had nothing to do with being sick it was just i'd connected it to being sick somehow which okay. is what I so time. so because because of the things you would do and the way you would avoid things yes. in relation to the phobia yeah. um you felt that they were a bit mad and you yes. felt a bit crazy and you felt that other people would also think you're crazy which is yes. not something a young person wants other people to think and mm -hmm. so for that reason you don't tell anyone. Correct. E yeah. You know, and that's, I know we've talked about it before on a podcast, but parents listening to this now, you think when, as a parent, you and I are both parents, right? As a parent, you want your 
child to know mm -hmm. that no matter what happens, they can tell you, right? Yeah. If, yes. if, if they're getting bullied, if something happens at school, if someone yeah. does something to them, if someone offers them something that you wouldn't want them to have, if they get, you know, what, whatever, you'd yeah. want them to know. But you think about being a parent and, and your child having something happening in their life mm. that they feel so conflicted about for whatever reason, yeah. they yes. won't even tell their own mum, mm. the person they're closest to. And we know that a lot of the metaphobes have a particularly close relationship with their mum. Mm -hmm. The only thing that that reminds me of, and it's a horrible link and I apologise, yeah. it reminds me very much of the thinking that kids have a lot of the time when they've been abused. Right. That they wouldn't want somebody to know that stuff. I can't ask mum and dad for help because they might think it's my fault. They might think I encouraged Uncle Fred. They might think it's my fault for Enjoy smiling, that. you know, whatever. It's that kind yeah. of stuff. And that, and that's obviously both for metaphobes and kids in that situation, a really horrible situation to be mm. in. Yeah. Because anything else you did fell over and hurt your leg, even if you got bullied at school, you'd mm. probably still tell your mum. Yes, you would. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. one person, but but you can't. So that that then makes it far worse, doesn't it? Because all of the pressure's on you. So I haven't asked you that, and, and, and viewers, listeners won't know this. So mm -hmm. much as I didn't know a great deal about Joe before, and I, I, I went out of my way to make sure I didn't ask. The same thing happens, Michelle. I know you've been a Thrive Coach for two or more years now. Yeah. Um, but what age did it start for you? Around the age of seven. I believe. Okay, that young. Yeah, that young, yes. Yeah, it was, I was told, because when I eventually did speak about it, when it's actually, I only started speaking about it when I couldn't hide it any longer. When it got to the <laughs> stage where I was going for a family meal or something like that, and I couldn't eat anything, I had to say something because I couldn't get out of the family meal and I couldn't avoid it because it was somebody's big birthday or something like that. I had to say something, my hands were tied. And actually, when I did start talking about it, it was it was my grandma I was talking to. And she said, well, you started feeling sick a lot when you were around seven, which is when my parents divorced. OK, so it was it was around that time of the separation. Okay. Um, and in the I was in the 90s and in the 90s, there was certainly not in, in my family or, or around here. Anxiety wasn't a thing. It wasn't spoken about. People didn't understand it. It wasn't the word didn't really exist <laughs> um no. and it was just i think it was nerves it was something i'll put down to my grandma described it to me but i was just given a, a little box of tums you remember those alka seltzer tums yeah. things so at seven i just used to carry a box of them around and pop those so i've no idea what how many of those i went through but so what lot. age was that you had that conversation with granny oh well, what am i now 30 like mid twenties when I started talking about it. Possibly. Wow. Okay. So yeah. you, you you had it from maybe age seven yes. till twenty seven. Yes. Yeah. Around. So there. you may have had it for twenty years and not yes. told anyone. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was it okay. was and and yeah. ev and every time you've got to avoid a situation mm -hmm. or every time you've got to try and mitigate a situation, you can't tell anyone why. Because they, yeah. they would know and they would judge you for it. Yes. So every time that happens, which is, as we know, probably every day in oh, some way, okay. shape or form, yeah. you're compounding that sense of I'm all on my own with this. Yes. I, I've just got to keep a grip on it. Yeah. And funny, someone reminded me that the day I talked about this years ago. Um, uh, And you won't remember, right, because you just said you're 32, right? So I don't think when you were younger it would have been about, right? But there yeah. used to be a program on the TV called The Generation Game. Generation I, Game? I don't remember it, but I've played it with the kids at school. Oh, right. And every <laughs> year they'd have these people on, that, yeah, and you, your family get together and they do all these silly things. And one of the things they had was this plate spinner. And basically you have like 8, 10, 12 spikes in the ground with a plate spinning on it, and the the, the – contestant the contestant has to go around keeping all these plates spinning and, and wiggling the things right and you just know that at some moment yeah one's going to come crashing to the ground yeah. and the person's going to panic and they all come crashing to the ground yeah. and someone once told me years ago that having a really strong desire for control particularly with something like a metaphobia mm -hmm. felt like that to them all the time and that was one of the reasons they didn't tell anyone because um, I can't remember the phraseology, but 
I'm only just keeping a lid on it myself. Yes. I'm running around keeping all of these plates spinning, right? Mm -hmm. I, I want to tell someone, but if I tell someone else, what if it just adds more plates? What if yes. it doesn't help? Yeah. And they just yep. go, oh, my God, you're mad. You're crazy. You're an idiot. Why are you yep. doing that? You should do this. You know, you're a bad person. You're whatever. And they just didn't have the kind of headspace or the bandwidth to run the risk of adding another three plates. 100 percent. It's it, it's exhausting. It's absolutely <laughs> exhausting because you are continuously putting out fires, problem solving all day, every day, all the time. It's It's a continuous continuous stream of how can I keep myself safe? How can I avoid being sick today? How can I avoid being sick tomorrow? It's it's continuous all of the time. So I got very, a question. very hard. <laughs> I got a question for you then yes. that's never occurred to me before and maybe it should have done. Okay. So we've always we've always talked about the fact and it's absolutely true that the vast majority of a metaverbs, I'd like to say all, but I'll clearly I've not met all, so it's possible there won't be any, right? There'll mm -hmm. be some that this doesn't apply to, but certainly all the metaphobes I've met and known and seen have all been very bright, driven, motivated, successful people, mm -hmm. even as youngsters in their lives. More successful than an average group of people. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. And we've always said that in a way a metaphobia is a symptom of that because they've all been very bright and driven and obsessive with a strong desire for control, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I actually wonder whether sometimes it's the other way around. So I'm wondering, yeah. I'm wondering if you're a successful adult yeah, because you had to be, not because you were. Right. Someone That's listening, really imagine really someone it, yeah. listening to this for the first time, right? And let's say yeah. they're not in a metaphor, but right? they know anything about it. And they're yeah. listening to this. It sounds very much like, you learnt this successful skill set mm -hmm. in your childhood because you had to. You know, can you imagine a seven-year-old having to go around keeping their secret, planning things, avoiding things, trying to mitigate exposure risks and, yeah, and yeah. wash their hands several times without mum and dad knowing and organising their day and get up early and go to bed late and all, you know. That's a, that's a fantastic skill set for, for a CEO, isn't it? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We've often described it as, as, as you know, if we had to describe all those thinking styles and behaviours that your average emetophobe has, we'd call it the problem-solving personality type. Oh, yeah. 100%. Because that's, but you were doing that hundreds of times a day at age seven. Yes. Yeah. It's no wonder that you became a great teacher. No, possibly not. I've never considered it either. That's a very good, a very good. So I'm going to have to go back and look at some of the data. Now, the difficulty with that is that the data <clears throat> suggests that um the the ranges for when it does appear go from young child up to kind of late teens but of course a lot don't really see it until their late teens and sometimes their early 20s in fact so right. that can't be the same for everyone but i wonder if it could in some cases be that clearly you were already a bright driven clever person i'm just asking myself another question now right sorry um <laughs> What if it's the other way round, mm -hmm. right? What if it's not Coo's law, but Sod's law, that maybe if you weren't already bright and driven and clever, mm -hmm. you'd have had to tell somebody earlier on because you wouldn't have had the coping skills. Yeah. And maybe yeah. you'd have got over it 10 years younger. Maybe Possibly. if you confide at age 15. Yes. Yeah, someone possibly. would have done uh, the, yeah, with the, but yeah google was around then right someone could have googled it maybe got you some help so maybe also being that skillful helped you keep it quiet for all yes. those years possibly possibly so yeah jumping back to what your friend said then so this is a friend you've had for ages well yes yes she's but, she's been around for ages she's sort of a um um an outer circle you know you have your inner circle of friends and there's mm -hmm. the outer circle she's been she's been on the periphery for a long time which is why we've never discussed and never crossed paths properly before but yes so i've talked about this before as well and <laughs> i've always said that if 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 boys had a metaphobia men had a metaphobia mm -hmm. which on the whole they don't a very very small percentage as you know right okay yeah we wouldn't because we don't tend to have so much social anxiety and feel so much pressure in that respect yeah. we would have probably told people earlier Yes. 
Yeah. Yes. We we I wouldn't think, have yeah. felt so much pressure. Maybe told someone, and maybe this is what happens. Maybe the seven year old boy or the eight year old boy that develops it does tell someone, feels massively relieved. Mum mm. says the same as what everyone would say. They don't judge you for it. They don't go, "Oh my god, you are crazy." They go, yeah. "Oh my god, you poor thing. How can I help?" Yes. Massive yeah. weight off your chest. You calm down. Desire for control calms down. You get some help. Mm. Okay. And it doesn't develop into full-blown emetophobia. So maybe the start point is there for young boys. Yes. But because of their lower levels of uh, um, experienced pressure and social anxiety, they do ask for support or tell someone, yeah. get some help, even if that help is just help. You know, even if it's not professional help, even if it's just mum saying, you know, oh, let's see what we can do. All right, I won't cook that then. And, and let's get yeah. you some special soap and, you know, I won't make you have school dinners. You can take a back lunch. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you, had, yeah. if you had an adult that helped you with those kind of safety seeking behaviours, maybe it wouldn't have developed. Mm, possibly. I, don't know. I think you might be onto something there because I think a large part of why I didn't tell anybody, obviously, because they think I was a little bit mad, right? But also because I didn't want to burden anybody. I didn't want to be that person to give anybody else anything else to do or to worry about or to think about. I think that's a, a pressure that's put on young girls uh, yeah. completely, you know, unintentionally. And I'm, this isn't a blame of anybody in my family or circle of friends at all. It's a society thing that women are the, the lucky after people. You look after yeah. others, you take care of others. Um, and I'm, I'm the eldest of siblings, and that was my role. I looked after. And so I, you and already I, had that pressure. So we would we would yeah. call that classically, wouldn't we? We would call that almost a, a, a collusive relationship. That that yeah. mother daughter thing where you don't want to burden her more, especially yes. as you just said. You know they've been going through a divorce, and there yes. must have been lots of stress in the house yes. anyway. Yes. Yeah. So absolutely. do you remember? I know I'm jumping about the place here. Do you remember the first time that you recognised that I, 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 you had it? Looking back now, it's a great question, and the answer I, I don't think there is a specific time that I realised I had it. But I'll tell you the moment that I real that I thought, "Gosh, I must be crazy," which I, or that I labelled myself yeah. as that, and that was in early childhood. That was primary school. Was and have you done a podcast with Joe about this about um, OCD being very closely linked? Yeah, I made a deal i went to a church of england school right and I, I was religious at the time and i made a deal with god that okay. if when i was i used to have um alternate days at mum and dad's so i'd sleep at mum's on one day dad's at the other and then we'd alternate through the week and i made a deal that if i didn't eat chewing gum ever that he would keep mum safe when i was at my dad's and he would keep dad safe when i was at my mum's and I, I promise i won't eat chewing gum ever why why that occurred i don't know but I then did not eat chewing gum until, gosh, late, late teens. I just avoided it, even though I really wanted to, and I quite like chewing gum. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have it because I'd made a deal, and I never spoke of that to anybody. Right. Um, but that's when I thought, that's a strange thing to do, and I knew I was avoiding it, and it was like, do you want to chew it? No, thank you. And I was like, mm, there's something going on. I knew, I knew I couldn't tell anybody about that, or I thought I couldn't tell anybody about that because I thought they're not going to understand why I'm doing this. And, that's, and, they that judge you, and they would judge you for it. That's it. Yeah. You see, boys don't, I'm generalising massively, but boys don't yeah. necessarily have that like that. They might think, they might say, they're going to judge me for it. Yeah. They're going to think I'm mad. But they would worry less about yes. other people thinking they're mad. Yes. Because yeah. boys go out and do mad things anyway, don't they? They yeah. climb yeah. trees and fall out of trees and yeah. pull their legs off spiders and horrible things like that, right? So they already do stuff that attracts sometimes that kind of level of attention. Mm -hmm. but, so what you're describing is something that I don't really talk about in the manuals very much, but you know, you've got, you've got control and your perceived control and then you've got yeah. desire for control. Yeah. Well, if you push desire for control even further down that continuum, mm -hmm. you've got this thing called the illusion of control. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Where, and this is effectively OCD. Yeah. 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 Where I'm feeling so out of control. I'm just going to make something up that I can control. Yes. To make myself feel better. So I'm talking yep. to you now, Michelle. I've got my full attention on you. But in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, did I lock that door? Did I, did I properly lock it? And, it, you know, it builds up or I'm building it up to the point where I'm, I feel compelled to go and check it. I check it. 
and it is shut properly and I calm down, I come back and talk to you again and then it yeah. starts to build up again. I have to double check it. And, you know, and what you did with the chewing gum thing is just that. It's the illusion yeah. of control. Absolutely. It's the attempt to get mm-hmm. more control than is humanly possible. You see it in the high street every day with people at, at, at um, a crossing, you know, with the Belisha beacons mm-hmm. and they press the button or uh, and, and they press the button, the light comes on and it says, wait, and they keep on pressing it <laughs> as if it will speed up. Or you get in a lift and you press floor eight and because nothing happens yeah. straight away, you keep pressing it, pressing it, imagining somehow that over-controlling it is somehow going to speed up that process in some way, shape or form. Yes. Okay, so when when it first manifested for you, yeah. what were the symptoms? What was that like for a seven-year-old? What were the symptoms? It was, at that stage, obviously it got worse with time because I built it up with time. So I added more things into my safety-seeking behaviours and I avoided more things as the years went by. But right at the beginning, it was around food particularly and types of food and making sure things were cooked. So I remember asking a lot, is it cooked? Is it definitely cooked? That kind of thing. Um, okay, yeah. You know, is it cooked through? Um, and I don't remember at that stage having an awareness, particularly around germs. Because I know you've described boys as climbing trees and whatever else. I was particularly tomboyish. I was very much out in nature and up trees and whatnot. So I don't remember at that time right. having the awareness, I don't think, of germs and things like that. And wash overly washing my hands that developed later on, um, but it was very much around food. I think possibly something I'd, I'd heard about food poisoning and sausages on barbecues was a big one as well. Because we had a lot of barbecues in my family, so I was always very much well. I'm not going to eat the sausages, and that they went out the window very early. Those kind of symptoms so we, for me. We, so did you, did you have did you experience those symptoms then before the focus became sickness? Were did, you yeah. a child experiencing those control type behaviors mm-hmm. even before it developed specifically into that? Yeah, I think looking back, I mean, it's it's very hard. And as we know, memory is not um, accurate. But looking back, I think what had happened was I was anxious at the time because my parents were separating. Therefore, I felt nauseous a lot of the time because that's what I was creating, the sense of unease and anxiety. And I think it was that sense of, I don't like this feeling. I don't like the nausea that I'm creating. I want to avoid ever feeling nauseous in the future. But I didn't know that I was feeling nauseous because of anxiety, because it wasn't talked about. It wasn't a thing. So I must be feeling nauseous because of the food. And I must be feeling nauseous because of other things. It, It... it took me till my, my late 20s to realise that it was a psychological thing. It was, I think I was blacklisted at the doctors because they thought it was, I kept saying, no, it's something definitely wrong with me. It's physically, I had all sorts of tests and things. So it was the avoidance of the, the feeling of nausea that I was trying to avoid. Okay, brilliant. On that, for the moment then, mm-hmm. what was that feeling? I know we all know what it is, right? But what yeah. do you think it was about that feeling? Because you wouldn't have felt the same way about pain, would you, or no. hard work? If no. you banged your no, knee no. and cut and cut your leg playing netball or football or no, anything no. else, right? You no. wouldn't have felt like that. You wouldn't have avoided no. football. So what was it about nausea that you didn't like? It's a good question. It might be the fact that it was not something I could shift. You know, if you bang your knee, you kind of rub it or you can move it or you, your leg sore, you angle it differently. It's unpredictable, comes and goes. Comes and goes, it's unpredictable. Um, And I suppose if I was feeling nauseous when I was anxious, then my thoughts would have all been around anxiety-provoking things and I wouldn't have been in a very happy space. I would have been unhappy at that stage or or scared or or whatever else. And it's it's tied to that not happy emotions, isn't it? Or unhappy emotions, not happy emotions. It's tied to unhappy emotions, isn't it? So I think avoiding the whole concept of being uncomfortable with your emotions or with this physical feeling that you're creating i think what was is what i was doing yeah so 
you know, desire desire for control, we've talked about before, but desire for control then is essentially an attempt to avoid situations that we don't like and feel vulnerable in because we don't believe we could cope. Mm -hmm. And so a, 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 a horrible, yucky, slightly out of control feeling that just seems to come from nowhere yeah. uh, um, that's that's unpleasant in its unpredictability. Yes, yes. You're going to think, right, what can I do to stop this feeling? Yeah. Well, it, it seems to it seems to be about maybe about food because it's in my tummy. So, you know, yeah. I feel it today, and we had sausages today. So maybe you know, and then you start trying to find why I'm feeling this way. Yes, yes, yes. And that and that's then how that the safety seeking behaviors kind of kick in and start. You've been very you've been yeah. very careful. I know. Been very careful not to use the word trigger, mm. because as you know, we don't use the word trigger, and you no. you, you didn't say triggered off by. Um, and the reason why we don't use the word trigger, as you know, is because the thinking styles and beliefs and attitudes and behaviours that create emetophobia were either mostly or entirely already present in you, weren't they? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So it, to, to say something's a trigger, I mean, a trigger, you know, comes from like the trigger in a gun, doesn't it? And like, yeah. you know, that gun's loaded and all it took was the trigger. It is a, it's a little bit pejorative and, and gives too much credit to the trigger, mm -hmm. right? Because it could yes. be an absolutely anything. And the vast yeah. majority of people don't remember a trigger, don't remember an incident that yeah. made them go, oh, my God, I hate being sick. I'm going to do that, right? So we don't talk about it in yeah. that respect because it also then detracts from the fact it's something that you are doing. Yes. Yes, yeah? it does. I think you're, you're, you're right there. Think... Sorry. <laughs> No, that's right. So, so it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's unhelpful for people to think of, you know, when parents particularly say, oh, well, it was caused by so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, we're always yes, quick yes. to say, well, look, it may appear like that, but actually bearing in mind it's created by the beliefs and thinking styles and attitudes yes. and behaviours and sense of disgust and all that kind of stuff, those things were already present in that person. Yes. So get back on track. For, from age seven to mm. early or mid twenties, you didn't tell yeah. a soul, not no. a boyfriend, not a no. best mate. No. D did you want to? Was there ever a time you thought, oh, for God's sake, I've still got this thing. I would love to just share it with someone. <sighs> yes. Towards the end. Yes. Cause it, it kind of gets to the point where again, you can't hide it. And I think I told a current boyfriend before I did my family um, because we were living together at the time. So it was, it was, you know, cooking things, but it was very much, yeah. he just thought I was over controlling with food. Didn't know why, you know, he just, he, he knew, he knew that I had to cook the meat and make sure it was cooked. And that, but he didn't know why I hadn't told him why it was just very much like, right. well, it's just, just make sure it's cooked, get that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it would have been a, a sense of relief. And it, it did get to the point where, well, I'm going to have to tell somebody because I'm actually getting particularly poorly with this i was underweight i got down to seven stone at one stage and i'm not i'm not a short person um so i, I knew i needed to tell somebody but it still wasn't an easy thing to do it, it's not an easy conversation to have if you've got emetophobia it's a it's a very lonely and isolating uh headspace to be in it's not an easy thing to do and and his reaction was It wasn't really. It was a bit of an anticlimax <laughs> because because he'd, he'd seen all my safety seeking behaviours anyway. He was sort of like, "Oh right, okay, that makes sense." But that you've not sense. been sick, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've not been sick, and you know, like, yeah, no, I and know. Like, and, right. yeah. and he moves on, yeah, and he moves on and forgets all about it because, of course, yeah. it's a massive, 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 massive thing for you. Yes. But to him, it's just a. a an explanation of your behaviour. Oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense. One cup of tea, love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, Isn't absolutely. It? Um, yeah. So, yeah. You, so you, your friend then, uh, from your out group of friends, when recently hearing what you do now and helping metaphobes and the fact you used to be yeah. that yourself, mm. if... If young... If, if any age of metaphobes were encouraged to tell their friends. Yeah. 
they'd be surprised how many of their other friends have also got it. I would think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I so think I've, so. I've, I've, yeah. I've often said, when people say to me, oh, I've never heard of that, and I'm talking to a lady about something, I say, listen, in your friendship group, you will have four or five friends that have got it. Mm. And, they, and they say, well, no, no one's ever said that. Robert said, that's the whole point. Yes. You will have <laughs> four or five friends. Michelle, even you, you will have four yep. or five friends that yep. have it mm -hmm. that yep. just have never told anyone. Or, or, or maybe still yeah. still have never heard the word emetophobia. It doesn't know what it is. They think, well, I've got yeah. a fear of being sick or I've got a fear of vomit or seeing someone else being sick. I don't know what this emetophobia thing is. Yes. It's bonkers, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you are right. That, I was talking to a friend that went to... Go oh, on, sorry. No, you go. You go. I was, I, I'm, I was talking to a friend. I was just going to say, I was to, just to add, add weight to that, I was talking to a friend um, that I went to university with and... Again, I hadn't spoken to her about it, chatting away in a way. And when I explained what it was, um, she went, oh, X person. I won't, I won't say the name, but let's call her Emma. Emma on our course had that because we both did psychology at York University, right? So she said, oh, Emma had that. I was like, oh. <laughs> so Emma had spoken about it. And I knew Emma. I'd been out, you know, on a few nights out with Emma. But I'd never spoke about it, and she'd never spoke about it. But clearly, somehow, she told my friends. So that, that it is quite widespread, but very, very seldom talked about. Yeah, I was just thinking at that note that 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 in your in your previous role as a teacher, maybe we maybe we should set up a, a campaign across schools mm. to um to, to 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 let people know that it exists. Yeah. And for and for kids that have got it, to realise they can tell their parents about it. They're not going to get judged for it. They're not going to get told off. They're yes. not going to get sent to their room. Yeah. You know, um, and that what once they talk about it, their their the speed to which they recover and can get over it and get mm -hmm. appropriate help. Yeah, I've got no figures on this, but it has to be reduced dramatically, doesn't it? Oh, surely. Surely, when I went through you know, this, the, the, mo the moment the moment you came out and told your boy, excuse me, your boyfriend, yeah, in a way, in a way, that was the beginning of the end of your emetophobia, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. But when I went through, yeah, the, the even if myself, it's sorry, when I went through the program myself, sorry, all them years ago, and got over it because I was a teacher at the time. The very first thing I thought was why are we not teaching kids this? Because it's a skill set. And my thought was, if I'd have known this when I was seven, I wouldn't have created emetophobia. I wouldn't have suffered for 20 years yeah. with it because it's it's so predictable and it's it's so it's easy is not the right word, but simple to understand and simple to put things in place so that you can get over it. But it's just, there's nothing out there. I didn't think there was anything out there. So Absolutely, I think we should be doing something for children in schools. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Did you did you did you try uh, anything else before you found the Thrive program? Yes, I did. I tried CBT, um, two two rounds of CBT, and the, my therapist at the time hadn't heard of emetophobia, didn't know what it was. Um, another one um, found emetophobia, the word because they, obviously they'd never heard of it. They were just treating me for scared of being sick and scared of eating certain things right but the second one was an online one that i got through the nhs actually i never i never actually saw them man or woman i'm not sure but we conversed online and they found a um a research article about emetophobia and that was such a eye-opening thing it wasn't it wasn't ours it was something that i think about what it was but it was such an eye-opening thing because i was like someone's written a research paper about me it was down to carrying bottles of water around and, and mint things. I was, it was such a relief to know that, one, it was a thing, it, there was a name for it, and two, there were other people like me, to the, and they'd been studied. It was, it was phenomenal. So anyway, I, I jumped, sorry. CBT, I did twice. Uh, I did EMDR because um, I was treated for post-traumatic stress disorder, so I did some EMDR there. Uh, I did some talking therapies. I, I, yeah, I tried various different things before I, I found the Thrive Programme. And, and did any of them put a dent in it help very much? No. <laughs> no, I, re I remember particularly CBT. 
um, because it has an element of exposure therapy in it. And I talked to, you know, we'd gone through the whole beliefs around being sick and all that kind of stuff. And then it was like, right, well, I want you to go and eat a sandwich or just a bite of a sandwich in a cafe this week and and let me know at the end of next week. And I remember walking out thinking, well, that's great, right? But I'm going to go feel really anxious, take a bite of this sandwich, feel really anxious for the next couple of days, expecting to be sick and hoping I'm not sick. And then she go, right, so you've done that. Well done. I was like, yeah, but that sandwich is different to next week's sandwich. It's different against the sandwich. Yeah. But it, it, I've learned nothing. I've got fur- no further forward. I just know I'm going to be anxious for these next few days. I knew there was more to it than just going and doing the stuff I've been avoiding. I needed something. There was something underneath it, which is exactly what the Thrive Programme tells you and teaches you. There's all that things underneath. And so, and, and then, and then you first went to the programme by yourself with a manual. I did. Yes. And then, and then a couple of years later, you went through it with a coach. Yes, yeah, I did it with a. Um, it wasn't even a couple of years later. It was at the start of the summer holidays. So I thought, right, here we go. Let's Google. I'll try and get over this again. Let's give it another bash. Found the Thrive program, got the manual, sat in that vividly remember in my hammock, reading it, and I was giggling away to myself. Right. Getting so well, um, giggling away to myself, and I got to sort of part way through it. I thought I can. I feel different. I was. I didn't drop any safety-seeking behaviors at that point, but I felt better because I understood it. So I was like, oh, already felt lighter, already felt better just reading it. And then it got to the end of the summer holidays, and I thought I'm onto something here. I don't want the progress to stop because I'm going back to school and I've, I'm going to have all this going on and not enough time. And at that point, I got a coach involved. So that right, I needed somebody to keep me going and keep me motivated. But I was already right. making progress just with the manual. Okay, and for clarity, for people that don't know you, haven't met you before, yeah, you know, and, and the most common question we still get is, is it, is it genuinely possible to completely get over it? Yeah. Okay, so how over it are you? Over it, <laughs> over it to the point. I had this conversation with a um, a potential client yesterday because that was exactly the question I got yesterday morning, and to the point where. When I do have an emetophobic thought, because occasionally I generate one, but it's so rare now that it's almost humorous. It's all, it's it's such a strange feeling now to have an emetophobic thought and to think, oh, I wonder if that's cooked properly. And I go, oh, that's a flashback, and it sort of it sort of takes me back. It's it's that it's that rare. So over but, it to that degree. But you, you, okay. So would you say that's a hundred percent? say so i mean it, i still generate them but i think Doesn't, but very very so you've, you've gone from having it. yeah you've gone from having several thousand thoughts a day about it yeah to maybe a couple a week uh, less less and than now a week. when you less oh, than a week yeah less than a couple of weeks yeah 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 okay a couple of months yeah and now when you have that couple of month yeah instead of being terrorized by them you laugh at them. Yeah, because it's, yeah, because I go, oh, I remember when I used to think like that. And it's usually when I'm coming up against something I haven't faced, bef- you know, in, in a while. So during COVID and whatever else, so you couldn't fly or go anywhere. So the first time I went to get on an aeroplane, I generated a thought or, or two about it. And I thought, oh, yeah, I did used to think like this. And it was at that point, it was like, it's only because it's new, right? Brilliant. I know what to do with this. And, and you get through it. Ease, I- complete ease. I- I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to demean or diminish your success in any way, shape, or form, right? No. By by even taking those two thoughts away, but I think normal people, yeah. in inverted commas, probably have one or two thoughts a month. Yeah. I mean, I I've got I've got a problem with being sick at all, right? But I probably think once or twice a month I might think, oh, have I eaten something? Yeah. Or or. Oh, you know, was there something in that? Where did that feeling come from? Yeah, yeah. And then kind of laugh at it or wafted oh, away or something. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you are again. I mean, I did know that. Obviously, you wouldn't be a coach otherwise. But mm-hmm. you are a person that had it really badly. Yeah. For most of your life, from age seven. Yeah. And are now completely over it. Yes. And you're also a Thrive Program coach, specialising in helping other people overcome their metaphobia. Yeah. And, and your particular interest then, perhaps because you're a teacher and you've worked all your life with kids, yeah. children with it. Yes. And is that also, do you think, because there is always that belief that, you know, 
I wish there was someone there for me when I was seven. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's the, again, it's not a blame thing. It's a, it's a lack of, of understanding and a lack of awareness. But if you can save somebody else having that exhausting time of it, because you, you, you do suffer with it and it's, it's mentally draining completely. But if you could save a child going through that, then why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to do that? And it's such a, it's such a rewarding job when I can see, when I see that happening with my clients and I see, I get these lovely email from parents who've just been away for the week and she's slept in her own room and she's, we've eaten out and she's had a lovely time. And I just think, yes, absolutely. Because it, you've saved yeah, that. It's amazing. I'm... Yeah. You've saved that child from 20, 30, 40 years of suffering. <laughs> So it's yeah. yeah, and they've got their life back. You know that that's that's a real common email we get at head office. You know, thank you, you've given my child their life back. Absolutely, yeah, that's brilliant, Michelle. I, there's so much I want to talk to you about, right? But I think we've probably done enough for today. Yes. Uh, next time, I'd like to talk to you about as a teacher in school, yeah, um, and an exometophobe, and, and what that's like, and what what kids are doing in school. But we'll save that for next time if that's right with you. Absolutely, yep. That's absolutely fine. That sounds good. Thank you very much. Brilliant. It's been great. Well, that's lovely. Listen, thank you very, very much. And um, we'll do it again next week and we'll get this uh, sorted and online as soon as possible. Anyone watching this, if you've got any questions for Michelle uh, um, that we can talk about in a future podcast, email them in on any of our social media, get in contact, and we'll uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks for watching.